Now, from the makers of Cold Water Irma. Through here, Mrs. Peel, this way. Wait. Light. Over there, Steed. Mrs. Peel and John Steed, snooping around Jeffcote products, burst into Jeffcote's office. Steed following Mrs. Peel's pointing finger. Jeffcote's legs were protruding from the end of the desk. Steed moved over, swinging the table lamp downwards. Phew. He looks as though he's been hit by a five-ton truck. But who could... I mean, he was a karate expert. Uh, not expert enough, it seems. Oh, Steed, look at that far wall. They both stared at the far wall. There was a large, splintered gap in the wooden partition leading to the warehouse. It was exactly as though a man of at least seven feet tall had walked straight through it. The Avengers. John Steed and Emma Peel. The Avengers. Episode 5 of this story, in which Emma Peel is placed in danger and John Steed discovers the horrible truth about... A deadly gift. John Steed and Emma Peel were investigating the deaths of various businessmen who were competing to obtain a concession from the Harachi Corporation. Four men... All key representatives have been brutally killed by an unknown assailant. And now, Jeffcott of Jeffcott Products had also met a nasty end. His neck appeared to have been broken by one blow. John Steed moved to the shattered partition leading into the warehouse and stood in the opening. The man-shaped gap quite dwarfed him. He stretched around in the opening with his umbrella. Well, whoever he was, he could hardly be called shorty. Emma Peel joined him in the opening. Yes. In through here. And exit for Mr. Jeffcott. And that leaves a clear field for Dr. Armstrong's concern. It must be his doing. Yes, but if it's, as you say, the worthy doctor's confined to a wheelchair, I presume the wheelchair's hardly this big. Uh, hardly. But he could have hired someone. Mm-hmm. Perhaps, but who? This size. And a karate expert? You know, it's strange, but all the staff at the Sensai Gymnasium are on the small side. All except Jeffcott himself, of course. I saw Jeffcott give an exhibition of karate chopping, which was quite unbelievably good. Who on earth could walk through this wall and tackle a man like that? Who? Or what? Pardon? Listen. Uh oh. False alarm. Just sounded like the electronic toys being set in motion. This is Peel. Look, there on the floor. A toy mechanical robot walking slowly towards us. Through this opening. Now, if that were seven feet high instead of seven Indeed, inches... Indeed, you can't mean... Dr. Armstrong runs United Automation practically single-handed. He has very few human beings on his staff because it's all computerized. He's kinky about mechanical aids and creating machines that do the job of men. Now, it could be that he has a killer machine... Nasty thought, isn't it, Mrs. Peel? Back in Mrs. Peel's apartment later that night, John Steed was making final preparations. What's that, Steed? Just trimming around this punch card. You think it'll work? I had a feeling I'd be paying Armstrong a second visit. So I got Gilbert to produce what you might call a, a skeleton key. This is it. Now... Here we have two punch cards, identical in the shape of the original, complete with perforations. How's that? Very pretty. Now, you hold on to this one. Oh, no. I'm not staying here. I want to get in on the act. Now, it's important that you stay in contact with Sama. I'm the only one who can block Armstrong's moves. 
Try the Harachi Corporation. Look here, I'll give you the number. Steed sat down at the desk, and taking the distinctively styled fountain pen from his pocket, he wrote on a pad. Now that's a nice pen. What an odd shape. It's like a submarine. Huh? Oh, there's. <laughs> yes, a, a wee gift from Dr. Armstrong. It only needs filling every ten years. Solid ink or something. Steed left the pen lying on the pad for Mrs. Peel. It's late, Steed. What if Tosama's left the office? Then try the big hotels. He's an important man. He must be on a hefty expense account. Being Japanese should make him easier to trace. What story do I use? Well, say you're my secretary from industrial developments and we'll make an offer first thing tomorrow. That'll stall Armstrong for the night. Armstrong must want that concession pretty badly if what you think is right. Yes, but somehow I don't think it's just for profit. Now, will you stay and follow through like a good girl? Mm. All right. But you'd better be back here by 11.30. And if I'm not? I shall use my punch card. That's what. Steed used his own punch card to gain admittance to United Automation. He dropped the card in the slot by the lifts. Enter the lift, please. Steed wondered privately if Armstrong had any method of monitoring the lift movements. If so, he could have a rather nasty reception waiting in the computer library. The lift stopped, Steed stepped out, the room appeared to be empty. Ah, so far, so good. Uh -uh. Oh, that figure slumped in that black leather chair. Enormous figure. Steed approached cautiously, wondering if it could be Armstrong, but the gloved hands that hung over the broad arms of the chair appeared to be lifeless. There was no sound, no movement, no sound of breathing. Steed suddenly reached for the reading lamp on the desk and flashed it on the inert figure. The hapless, indefinable face was covered with a light-coloured stocking mask, upon which perched dark glasses. Hmm, gotta get a better look at you, chum. Working swiftly, Steed removed the stocking. Underneath was the stainless steel face of an automated man. Steed tapped the face with the glasses. A robot, all right. A killer robot, maybe. Steed replaced the stockinged mask and glasses. Nothing but a dark hat lay in the figure's lap. A sudden noise alerted Steed. He looked around for a place to hide. There wasn't any cover in this soulless, clinically neat room. Steed spotted the air conditioning grill. Oh, blast. It's bound to bring someone. Steed succeeded in getting the metal grill free and squeezing into the air shaft closing the grill back into position just as the door opened and Armstrong in his automatic chair glided into the room. Oh, come, Benson. No need to worry about answering that. Is... is... is that it? In the chair, that is. <laughs> yes, that is it. The Pabulum robot. He's quite harmless, really. That is, until programmed. Then even I can't stop him. Of course, he's only a prototype, like a child, really. One day, he'll have a brain more efficient than this computer. He'll be powered by solar energy, and that steel casing will stand the blast of an atomic shell. He, he looks quite human, uncanny. Yes, but he travels with the accuracy of a guided missile. How? Oh. Let me show you. He's directed by a simple radio transmitter. Now, Steed's frequency is point double one three. Watch. Steed, in the air conditioning shaft, was all ears and peered out anxiously. Armstrong made an adjustment to the panel on the computer. A radar screen lit up. A small flashing light commenced to bleep upon it. There it is. That's Steed's transmitter. The fountain pen I gave him nestling comfortably in his breast pocket. Steed, listening at the grill, automatically felt in his pocket. Oh, Mrs. Peel. I left the wretched thing back at the flat with Mrs. Peel. Now... All we have to do is set the Pabulum robot switch to the same frequency. A counter bleep could be just heard coming from the robot. It got to its feet and headed with a shuffled tread for the lift doors. Armstrong pressed the button to release the doors and said, So, Benson, that will be the end of Steed, and the concession will be ours. In the air conditioning shaft, John Steed knew he'd got to move quickly. 
He crawled his way along, searching for another exit grill. There wasn't one. He was trapped. In the computer library, Benson and Dr. Armstrong watched the progress of the two dots on the radar screen. When the pabulum robot reached the fountain pen transmitter, it would kill viciously. In Mrs. Peel's apartment, Emma was making a phone call, the offending fountain pen lying in front of her. Thank you, Mr. Tassano. I'll get Mr. Steve to phone you tomorrow morning without fail. I'm sure we can do business. Yes? Yes, I've got that. 11.30. Goodbye. Mrs. Peel replaced the telephone, picked up the pen, and made a note of the time of appointment. Then she took up the evening paper, made herself comfortable, and began using the pen to complete a crossword. The pabulum robot ploughed on. Some time later, John Steed, wandering about the tunnels of the air conditioning unit, found himself in what appeared to be a small maintenance room. It had a door, but no handle from the inside. Like being trapped in a meat safe. Well, what's that? It was a thermostat control. The fans were set to 65 degrees. Steed smiled and turned it all up to maximum. The temperature rose quickly. Later, in the computer library, Armstrong looked up from the radar scanner. It's getting darn warm in here. Nerves unable to stand the pace, Benson. Oh, it isn't that. Look at the thermometer on the wall. It's over 70. It's nearly 75 now, and it's going up. What? Hey, must be a faulty thermostat. I'll call maintenance. Steed, back in the maintenance room, wiped the sweat from his brow and took up a position by the closed door. A short while later, the door opened. Steed reached for a heavy spanner and was about to bring it down on the head of the man who entered when he stopped. It wasn't a man. It was a white-coated robot. Slowly and with difficulty, Steed edged past the robot and made a quick exit down the corridor. Get going, Steed! Time ticked on. Mrs. Peel finished the crossword and looked at the clock. It was nearly half past eleven. She rose, put on a warm jacket, and unconsciously slipped the fountain pen into one of the pockets. She headed for the door, down the steps, and towards her car, making sure that she had the punch card in her handbag. The robot, which was about to climb the outer stairs, turned and lumbered down them again. Near thing, that, Mrs. Peel. <laughs> Avengers. Listen every evening, Monday to Friday, to John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers, brought to you by the makers of Cold Water Omo.